from late 92, early 93, give or take, I can't remember the exact time frame, in that time frame, Eddie Gilbert started calling and said that he was uh, going to work for this promoter in Philadelphia, uh, Eastern Championship Wrestling, and he wanted me to come in. And, and uh, just having come through this political bullshit with WCW again, I said, you know, Eddie, I, I'd love to work with you again. I said, but I'm done. I'm getting out of the business. I have no stomach left for it. And a week would go by and he'd call me again and say, well, how about if we give you this much money instead of that much money? And I said, uh, thank you, Eddie, but it's not about the money. And, and this went on for several weeks, you know, and him calling me once, twice, three times a week and keep sweeting the deal and, you know, this and that. And, you know, it just, hey, thanks, but no thanks. I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. But thank you for thinking of me. But, you know, finally he said, uh, what if we let you be the lead heel for the company? And I remember thinking on the phone going like, like nobody's ever offered me that before, you know? And I thought, well, uh, I almost said no. And then I thought, well, it's for a little company in Philadelphia. I mean, how long is it gonna go, right? A week, month, two. And uh, so we agreed on a price and I said, I'll come out and do it, but if I see any signs of politics, any signs, I'm turning around and walking out the door. And he agreed to that. And I went to Philadelphia and I remember the first day uh, uh, we, Terry Funk and I had flown in right around the same time. We were both picked up by the same car and we were driving over to the hotel and Terry always called me Shano. He said, well, he would sit behind me and lean up and tap me on the street. He said, well, Shano, how long do you think we'll ride this train before it runs off the tracks? And we sort of joked and laughed about it and thought maybe two or three months, you know, before we'd be out of, out of business. Neither of us, you know, I was still young and dumb to the business, but Terry, who was old and seasoned in the business, uh, he didn't see it going past that either. You know, and, uh, ECW really did the impossible. It became something, it was one of those things where all the, all the uh, parts of the machine were all lined up perfectly. The stars were all lined up perfectly. The, the major companies, WCW and WWF, had gone on cartoon land. Uh, the other smaller companies were falling away. Independents were doing okay business, but there was there was a place for another company to provide a different product. You're mentioning all the names that were part of ECW at this point. Was it profitable at this point with no. all those big names now? No. The, uh, uh, you know, I think at that point they were still trying, Todd was still trying uh, with Eastern Championship Wrestling to use these stars of yesteryear to, to pull a crowd in. And there would be some semblance of the crowd that wanted to come see that. What was going to work was you couldn't, you know, you couldn't go if, if everybody is selling vanilla. You can't go and sell French vanilla and say you're different. It's still vanilla. And in the business was all pretty similar flavors of, of vanilla, just using that flavor as an example. Suddenly ECW came out and was, you know, Rocky Road. You know, it was something completely different. Uh, I'm sure it turned a lot of fans off that were used to that traditional wrestling model. But there were also, I think, a lot of fans that had grown so tired of the, uh, you know, Dean Douglases and dead men coming back to life and evil hockey players with one blackened tooth and the evil plumber and just that stupid garbage crap uh, that suddenly here was a company that was talking to you in language that you use at home and on the street, uh, doing things that you'd always hoped for to see, uh, then it ramped up a violence that had not been seen in American wrestling before. Uh, we had heard about this, much like when I was a kid reading the magazines, we had heard about these ultra-violent matches in Japan, but again, you can only imagine, you weren't seeing them again with no live streaming, and suddenly here came ECW giving you something like that, and not just that, but here's Benoit who played Pegasus Kid in these matches, and here's Sabu who became a big name over there, names that we hadn't yet seen on the American American scene because they hadn't been overexposed in the WWF and WCW and now they're here in ECW and oh yeah there's Shane Douglas used to be a world tag champion and there's Sherry Martell and there's and there's and there's there was enough there and each time that Paul would cut what like a Jimmy Snooker loose for instance nothing against Jimmy it was just a purely just looking at it from a business point of view uh, if we take Jimmy off and we free up some money to maybe bring in two or three other guys now you bring in 
a Dean Malenko and a Chris Benoit, or a super crazy and, and a Tajiri, or a Rey Mysterio who, or an Iconium. You know, each time he would get rid of one of those larger names of yesteryear, he would bring in one of these new names that, that some segment of the audience was going, man, I would love to be able to see those guys. And here they were for the first time congregating together. In those early years, uh, Todd Gordon, I guess, was the backer. Where was his financial finances coming from? Todd's family uh, owned a, uh, a jewelry store, a well-known jewelry store downtown Philadelphia. Todd was individually wealthy. Uh, but I would imagine much of that wealth was on paper. You know, it wasn't like he's got $10 million sitting in a bank vault somewhere or some huge corporation that was willing to lend him, you know, whatever money he needed or the credit to get on a major network. Uh, so I've often, in looking back, wondered, A, how were they able to, to do this? Because in the early days, uh, first three to six months, we'll say, you know, the ECW arena was not full. The first couple, uh, I think the first one or two shows had two or three rows of people. Uh, we were giving out free free uh, coupons for free beer and hot dogs. Uh, but once that caught, it, it grew very quickly. It went from that two or three rows to 75% full, then jam-packed, then turn away crowds very quickly. But in Jim Thorpe, we were wrestling at the Flagstaff, there's 75 people in the building. Jammed. It wasn't like it was an empty building, but it was tiny, it was much, not much bigger than this room. And uh, those checks always cleared. You know, we'd wrestle in front of a couple hundred people over the weekend, and my checks would clear, 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 clear. Uh, you know, and then <laughs> much later we'll get to it, I'm sure, you know, the Inverse Universe, suddenly we're wrestling in buildings in front of thousands of people, sellouts, and the checks are bouncing like rubber balls. Uh, but Todd's, uh, Todd's money came from, from, as far as I know, from the jewelry store, and I think there was a bit of family money behind it, uh, but certainly wasn't wealthy to the point where he could have floated ECW through years and years of growth. Right.